I'm Gino Parati, and I'm an expert in the field of interpersonal communication, which means that I study human behavior in the context of relationships. I'm a published author on the subjects of culture, gender, nonverbal communication, and soft skills. I'm also a self-identified empath and apparently an INFJ if you're into the Myers-Briggs stuff. Having lectured at some of the largest and most prestigious universities and colleges in the United States, I've seen firsthand how powerful communication can be in transforming our mindsets, our perspectives, our relationships, and ultimately the way that we experience our lives. So that's why I've created this podcast, to help us expand our social and emotional intelligence, which can lead to more effective communication and better relationships, both with others and with ourselves. A former student, Emily, and I were having an interesting conversation about what is going on with people socially and emotionally during this pandemic. So I invited her to share this conversation on this podcast. Episode 1, Solitude versus Loneliness. In an effort to protect our physical bodies during this pandemic, many people are practicing social distance and implementing a quarantine. We're less than two weeks into this now, And as I've been talking with my family, friends, and social network, I'm hearing that anxiousness and loneliness are surfacing for people in isolation. That doesn't surprise me. Nonverbal communication is one of my areas of specialization. And we know from nonverbal communication research that touch is probably the most essential of our five senses. It's the only one we cannot live without. It's also one of our earliest forms of communication that we experience as humans. Cradled in our mother's womb, near to her heartbeat, surrounded by her touch. So our earliest experiences as we're developing are not in isolation, but in physical partnership with our mothers. Plus, we are tribal animals, where for eons of history, survival meant being part of a group. So it makes sense that flipping the switch to isolation could have negative effects for people. What has surprised me is that overall, I'm not feeling anxious, and I'm not feeling lonely. The social scientist and researcher in me wants to know, why is that? Why is it that some people can, while others can't, be alone? Thanks, Emily, for joining me for this conversation. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Something I wanted to know is the difference between solitude and being alone. Yeah, it's a great question because it's interesting. They're similar in some ways, but there's some really distinct differences. I define solitude as being in my own company. It's a time for me to talk to myself and to meditate with a body scan or a walking meditation. So solitude is being with yourself in connection with yourself. Alone is being by yourself. Mm. And Merriam-Webster Dictionary says that it's a separation from others. So both are isolation, that's where it's similar, meaning by yourself, but solitude is about connection, whereas isolation is about separation. Why can't many people be alone? I I wonder that too. Um, I think routine and social habits has something to do with it, that people just develop certain patterns of behavior, and they get used to those patterns, and they just keep Mm. retracing those same pathways, Um, a, a visual way that I often think of is like on college campuses, you walk through grassy areas and it becomes a cow path. So that's the familiar pathway and people just keep walking it and grass never grows there because everybody just keeps walking that same path back and forth. And many of us develop these social routines where we just keep retracing those steps. I mean, don't even consciously think about it anymore. We just keep doing it. So if you've developed a a social circle and you just keep retracing the same path, that becomes your normal. Uh, I think another reason why many people can't be alone is that a lot of people are really uncomfortable with their own thoughts or the feelings that they have. And I think they're uncomfortable because they don't know how to process them. They don't know what to do with them. And that's you know why we're talking about this stuff is to provide people with the tools for emotional intelligence. And then that leads into social intelligence, being conscious of your thoughts, conscious of your feelings, and being able to, to direct those more, understand them more. So what, like, what are some methods in order to be cognizant of your thoughts? Well, the first is recognizing how thoughts actually work. And we have to be mindful that the content of our thoughts, once you have a thought, 
um, it's typically about 17 seconds for that thought to be able to start creating a neuronal pathway in our brain. And then that pathway becomes the path of least resistance, where when we have a thought, it just keeps re-triggering the same familiar thought over and over and keeps going down that same neuronal cow path again and again and again. And many of our thoughts are formed without our input meaning that a lot of us are retracing steps and pathways that were actually carved out from our earliest childhood experiences. So other people decided what our thoughts were. They put those thoughts in our brain, and then the pathways were formed, and we just keep retracing re, uh, those old pathways. Now that we're adults, we can have a more conscious and active process in, in creating the thoughts that we're having by following that 17 seconds, uh, being more conscious of holding a positive thought for a longer period of time, not holding on to a negative thought for more than 17 seconds, thoughts that don't serve us. And that's really what I define as positive and negative. It's, is the thought serving me well? That's a positive thought. Yeah. Is it no longer serving me? That's a negative thought. So I can drop that thought. That's difficult, I feel like. Oh, for sure. Um, it, it can be difficult because it starts with the the idea of what are we even thinking? <laughs> um, and that that uh, requires you to some degree to develop the observing mind. So I'll use the metaphor, and this is just a metaphor, but the metaphor of the left brain, the hemisphere, and the metaphor of the right brain. So if the right brain is responsible for the more emotional experiences in our life, then the right brain is literally living in the present moment, experiencing this life emotionally. The left brain is the analytical side, and the left brain has the ability to develop into the observing mind, which is you recognize um, that you're having a good time. You recognize that you're not having a good time. And then you're going to ask yourself and interview your right brain. So it's like your left brain is interviewing your right brain and saying, huh, you're having fun. That's great. Why are you having fun? How do you know you're having fun? What, what aspects of this do you like? Can you recreate this in the future? And when you take that approach, that's why I was saying it's like uh, solitude is you're with yourself because there's these two voices, these two hemispheres in your brain that are now talking to one another. One is living in the moment and experiencing and the other is talking about it and interviewing it and trying to understand it and um, detect these patterns of behavior so that you can recreate, again, what serves you well. Being alone and in solitude, they, they don't have to, to be uh, mutually exclusive. I want you to be able to start viewing alone time as solitude so that you are in connection with yourself and you always have that that observer mind with you interrogating, asking questions about your, your life experience. Because once you do become conscious through that observing mind, that's where you have the power to recreate those thoughts, help choose your thoughts so that your um, experiences then become things that consistently feel good for you. What are your personal experiences with loneliness and solitude? Uh, I'd say probably one of the most fundamental moments in my life where I learned about the transformation between loneliness, transforming it into solitude. It actually started in my early 20s, and I can vividly recall that time. I'm, I'm 41 now, so we're looking at about 20 years ago. Yeah, I was 21. Actually, it was exactly 20 years ago. Uh, I moved from Pennsylvania, where I grew up and went to college. I just graduated from college, and I moved to Central Florida, the Orlando area, and uh, to uh, begin my adult life, and I had accepted my first job. Literally had everything that the world told me that I should want. I had my health. I had a, uh, an apartment. I had a car. I was able to take some trips. I was able to buy some clothes. Had everything that the world said that I should want to be happy, and I wasn't happy. And... Uh, I was feeling very, very isolated, so not in solitude because I didn't yet know who I was to be able to connect to myself. I didn't figure out, though, to be honest with you, what this separation was, why I was feeling isolated and why I wasn't able to transform that into solitude. Didn't really figure that out until my later 20s. I didn't want to face a truth about myself. And that truth was, by the time I was 27 years old, I could no longer run from it, and that's that I am gay. And I grew up Catholic, and I also grew up, uh, I was about 1920 when Ellen DeGeneres came out and she lost her TV show in the 90s. So I say all of that because I was coming of age at a time where it wasn't really okay still to be gay, mm. hence the backlash that Ellen had experienced. 
So you combine that with my um, Catholic, extreme Catholic upbringing. And I, I had messages all the time growing up that it wasn't okay to be who I actually was. So I'd say the biggest thing for me was allowing myself the permission to feel what I did feel, which was the romantic and sexual attraction, the desire to experience those pleasures with another man that I cared about. Um, so allowing that permission to feel such a central part of a uh, human experience, that opened me up to connections of all type, connections with friends and of course dating partners. But for me, the biggest win from that was the connection with myself, mm. longer running away from something that I didn't want to face. So with that permission that I gave myself came the ability to be comfortable in my own company. Yeah, so it's it's about permission. And, uh, you know, I use the, the example of being gay and I just want to make it clear. It's not that I think that everybody's problem is your, your secret homosexual desires. <laughs> <laughs> Though I do think people have more than they admit. More people have those than they're willing to admit. I agree. But uh, ultimately, it's about something about yourself that you just, some secret that you, you think if somebody found out that they wouldn't love you. And ultimately, it's because you don't love yourself for that reason. So action steps, right? So how can we transform the fears of being alone into solitude? It's really about emotional intelligence. So for me, I define emotional intelligence in three steps. Uh, simple to say, it's a couple of them are simple, but the last one is what I call a Grand Canyon leap. Like it's monumental to be able to cross that divide. But step one is really simple. Almost everybody who's alive can do this. And that's step one, hey, I'm feeling something. So just recognizing that there maybe was a shift. I was feeling sad and, oh, now I'm feeling happy. I noticed there was a shift. So being able to recognize that I'm feeling something here, that's step one. Step two becomes a little bit more difficult, but again, most people can do this. Once in a while, there's people who struggle, but most people can correctly identify what they're feeling. Label it with happy, sad, jealous, um, surprised, scared, excited. So being able to identify the, the emotional experience okay. and put a name to it. Because once you put a name to it, you can begin talking about it, which allows you to process it. So here comes the final step, but this is the Grand Canyon leap. So while almost everybody can do step one, most people can do step two. This is where I, I do a lot of work with people, and this is the biggie, moving into um, solitude with yourself. So transforming this uh, fear that people may have about being alone during this time of the pandemic, transforming it into moments of solitude where you realize you're really not alone, but you're in your own company. And that is um, being able to answer the question, why am I feeling happiness, sadness, fear, anger, jealousy, excitement, surprise, whatever emotion that you identified in step two. Um, and I'll give a quick example of this. My younger sister, and I already told you she was the first person that I came out to, she and I lived together for eight years before she ended up getting married. So we had a lot of time, adult time in our 20s, growing up together and experiencing life together in that way. So um, I, I talked to her about almost, well, not almost, actually everything. <laughs> she's, the, she's the person, if you want the dirt on me, you go to my younger sister. She knows everything. Um, so that relationship, uh, when she did get engaged, I, I like her husband very much and she loves her husband and she wanted to get engaged to him. So when he did propose to her, I felt a mixture. Like I recognized when she got the ring and she called me up that she got it. I recognized that I was feeling something and actually more than something. I was plural. I was feeling some things. And step two was, hmm, what am I feeling? Well, one obvious thing was happiness. Mm -hmm. I was really happy that she got engaged to a man that she cares about and who, who loves her. And she wanted this, so I was happy for her. But I also was recognizing that I was feeling a little bit of sadness and uh, a little bit of jealousy. And I said, what is that about? Because this is, a, this is a good thing. We're glad she's engaged to a good guy. So what's the sadness and the jealousy about? And the more I dug into it... Um, Sometimes I was thinking, am I jealous that I'm not getting engaged because I'm still not dating anyone, et cetera? Yeah, no. I mean, one day I may want to get married if I meet the right guy, but no, I actually kind of like being single a large, large majority of the time. Um, I recognized what it was, and what it was is um, realizing that her engagement meant that the life that we had had together, those eight years living together, that were such beautiful years and such a wonderful experience being able to, to be with my sister during that time that that particular moment 
chapter was over and it would never look the same again. And so that's what the sadness was about. And the jealousy was a little bit about um, that he was going to get the majority of her time, my best friend's time. And that allows me to now ultimately not feel what's called a meta emotion, guilt and shame. If I could eliminate those two things from our life experience, oh, I think the world would be such a better place. It's because what we end up doing is many people would say like, I'm happy for my sister. She got engaged. And then you recognize, hey, I'm feeling jealousy, but you don't give yourself permission to recognize that you're feeling jealous. And the reason you don't give yourself permission is because you feel guilty because you don't think you should feel jealous. And so you never get to step three, which is understanding what your jealousy is about. My jealousy in this case was actually a beautiful thing, right? It actually talked about how strong the relationship was between my sister and I. That's all. Right. It just, it, it, it showed how strong that bond is. And so when I understood that, there's no reason to feel guilty about feeling jealous. And then I can let the jealousy dissipate. Say I was trying to do an analysis of my emotions. How would I go about some actionable steps to even get to step one or step two? Um, you could journal would be one aspect where you're writing down um, the feeling. Well, actually, I'd say even before journaling, let's go something back to uh, something I mentioned really early on with the idea of solitude. And that's a body scan meditation. It's a really cool experience where you get very still. When I do it, I like to lay down on the floor and have nothing touching me. And as I'm laying down on the floor, I start at one end of my body. So either from my feet and then move up to my head or opposite. I often start opposite where I start at the top of my head and I move down to my feet. And so what I allow it to do, it's almost like a visual image as if there was like a, uh, a laser scanner going down my body horizontally for each section of my body, I allow my brain to mentally be thinking, so what does the top of my head feel like? Maybe it'd be like, oh, I can feel the floor on the back. Um, I have a little tension in the top of my head, or maybe there's no tension today. And it's a little itchy. I'm not going to itch it, but I feel an itch. Then you scan down my nose. Oh, there's a little bit of congestion. Um, then you scan down your mouth. What is that? feel like right now yeah i don't have anything going on in my mouth my throat you just keep going all the way down your body calling conscious attention to the different parts of your body so it'll be the entire body any kind of sensations that you're having and you're not judging them you're not trying to fix it like i said about the itch oh my cheek is itchy let me itch that no no no. it's just huh, my cheek is itchy just call attention to it and move on from it Mm. and then you can transition the physical to the emotional When you look at things that are a little bit more new agey or um, like massage therapists, you're carrying your tension in your shoulders. Our bodies are responding to our physical or our mental experiences. And a quick example of that is um, when I was younger, I know I'm not the only one who had this experience, but I dreamt that I I woke up, I had to pee, I walked into the bathroom, I'm standing in front of the toilet, and I start to pee. And then I wake myself up actually peeing myself in bed. And I was a little boy. And so I give that experience um, to make you realize that your body responds to your mind. Your body doesn't understand the difference between reality and perceived reality or mental reality. And uh, therefore, if you're constantly uh, experiencing something as stress or as fearful, as life-threatening, even though it's not, your body doesn't understand that it's really not. So it's going to manifest the physical symptoms of that uh, imagined reality and respond as if it was real. That's pretty incredible. It is. Well, and, and the knowledge of it's incredible because it allows us to then realize when you say you choose your thoughts. Yeah, because what you're doing is you may not be able to change physical reality all of the time. You know, like right now we're not able to control this, the virus at the moment. We can't make it just disappear like we would like it to. But what you can control is your perception of this environment and the perception of of your safety, the perception of the world you want. So your body's going to be responding with physical effects from the, the reality that you are experiencing in your head. So if you're living a fearful life in your head, you're going to have physical repercussions in your body because it's responding to that fear. Absolutely, there are some things that are uncertain and that can make people scared. But if you switch the lens, because if you can't, you you can do what you can to mitigate certain dangers, right? But we're not fully in control of this at the moment. So you do what you can, and then you keep living your life. 
observing those those safety precautions. And while you're just living your life with those safety precautions, you're turning your attention no longer to the dangers because you're already controlling what you can control. Um, you are turning your attention to the opportunities, which we're going to be talking about in future episodes. How can I use this time for something beneficial? So here's the takeaway. A great way to start is step one. Hey, I'm feeling something. Begin with your physical body. Recognize how the different parts of your body are feeling. Ultimately, this step is building you towards greater emotional intelligence. And once you work your way to step three, you realize you don't have to feel lonely. Loneliness can be transformed into solitude. So take this time to be in connection with yourself and stay tuned because we are building our way to step three. Thanks for listening to the Right Brain Journeys podcast. For more insights about social and emotional intelligence, subscribe to this podcast and follow me, Gino Parati, on LinkedIn or like Right Brain Journeys on Facebook for information about one-on-one coaching as well as group workshops and learning sessions.